Thank you. As you know, I come from Nepal, and right now we have no constitution, no parliament, essentially no government. And we have a prime minister from the Maoist party. And uh, this is a party that has been promising scientific education, scientific land reform, scientific health care, scientific everything you want to see. Now, before the scientists among you start getting excited about it, <laughs> for them, scientific means <clears throat> unequivocally Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. Anything else is renegade, renegade bourgeois corruption and imperialist plot. So we have to be very careful about the use of science. It's one of those legitimating words that people like to hijack for their political purposes. Uh, one more word about Nepal before I move into other general areas and water. Our entire experiment in 2005-2006 with the regime change and all was based around the idea of consensus. We've been talking about scientific consensus here. Our whole interim constitution was based on one vastu principle, one fundamental architecture, which was consensus. That all political parties would have a consensus to build a new constitution. Well, it collapsed this constitution from day one. And everything that happened afterwards led to the demise of the Constituent Assembly, despite its self-prolonging life of doubling its own life by two years from what people elected it for. And right now, we are in this tremendous limbo. Now, this consensus could not happen simply because we had political parties, 32 of them, holding everything diverse in the political belief and opinion from extreme Maoism and Pol Potism on one extent, you know, to liberal democracy and traditional means on the other. And in that spectrum, you found everybody. Well, how are you going to get a consensus? Another, what we are essentially talking with these words and science and policy and advice is Brahmins behind the throne and their incantations. How powerful are those incantations? Do they produce the desired effect or not? Is what we are really talking about. So consensus, scientific, are these legitimizing incantation words. There are other ones just in case and we are not alone in company. Progressive. That's another great word. Everybody wants to be progressive. And of course, they define progressive in every which way you can think of. Development is another one of those. In so southern countries, for example, on the dam debate and everything, the worst pejorative, the worst label you can put on an opponent is anti-developmental. Finished, your career is gone after that. Growth is another great word. Modern. Everybody wants to be modern. I don't know how many schools there are in Nepal that have the first prefix modern, modern this school and modern that school. Democratic, another great word, legitimizing, like the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. <laughs> I really wonder why the dear leader stopped at that and didn't say it was democratic scientific, you know, People's Republic. It must be his inherent modesty. <laughs> the other great legitimizing word is international community. And in Nepal's case, we have seen that international community, as per BBC's report, if you say, uh, could be as little as Britain, a couple of Nordic countries, a reluctant United States, and perhaps France and Germany. But it would not include the two hefty superpowers that we are sandwiched between, China or India, would not include Russia would not include Japan, and would not include the powerful Southeast Asian countries like Thailand and everybody else. But it is said, the international community feels this way. What a legitimizing hijack. Now, the problem here is that these words all work in normal times. But they do not work in times of flux and crises. Everything is working normal, that's OK. There's an easy public-private partnership. Everything seems to work. But when times are in flux, groups seem to retreat into what I call enclave loyalty. And it's the legitimacy of enclave loyalty that matters. 
scientific truth be hanged? Your scientific truth or the truth of my enclave, which is claiming to be scientific also? What a great example from Nepal is right from the 70s, we have had this alarm, scientific alarm of Himalayan degradation. That Nepal is going to be washed into the sea, all of Himalaya. Uh, and Nepal will be bald as a coot in whatever it is, 10 years time. And every 10 years we have had this scare. The problem is, and, and therefore all aid programs and all foreign aid and all development agencies were, you know, hell bent on afforesting just about everything that could be afforested in Nepal to prevent this uh, degradation. The trouble was it was based on, well, with hindsight now, we can say wrong science. Why? We have more forest cover than we ever did before. Not because of the aid agencies and what they were doing, but thanks to community forestry. Something completely different came out of nowhere. But the entire international community was geared around this idea of afforesting Nepal so there would be no floods in Bangladesh. Brian asked this question at the beginning, talking about whose question. And if you ask the farmer in Nepal, this you know, absolute poor subsistence farmer, why are you cutting this piece of tree, you know, forested land in the hill slope, uh, he would not say that it is because I want to, you know, I, when I'm afraid I'm going to be causing floods in Bangladesh and therefore I should not. What he will say is I need to feed my family. I'm growing only enough to feed my family for six months a year and the other six months I'm going to go find a job in India or something like that. And therefore I have to feed my family. So the questions are completely different about what. So what I'm trying to ask over here, you know that cartoon was done in the Mekong when I was giving this kind of a lecture. Uh, Roger from Colorado and me from you know, Trans Himalaya and Nepal Tibet border, I can tell you there's a phenomenon, there's a Native American word for it which I've forgotten and there's a Tibetan word also which I've forgotten. We have 113 languages so I can't remember all of them. <laughs> but there's a language that describes this phenomenon. You know there's thunder and lightning that goes on and you drive towards it. When you come there you find out that there was yes there was a column of rain that you saw falling but nothing hits the ground. It's so dry and low pressure over there that a raindrop evaporates before it hits the ground. It's a natural phenomenon. Much of the international policies are exactly like that. Whether they are MG, MDGs or Kyoto Protocol or you name it, none of that really hits the ground where it matters. So my concern and our concern you know, down south is that what we have is we have a lot of eagle eye science, you know, on this fancy global modeling, you know, all this sort of stuff. And based on that, predictions are made and recommendations are made. But the trouble is you ask that farmer who's taking dishes, millions and millions of people all over the southern world are deciding by themselves, by household by household. They're taking decisions that has nothing to do with MDGs or with anything else. They haven't even heard of it and wouldn't care if they heard about it. So these decisions are not captured by eagle eye science. They need to be captured by what we call toad's eye science. Neither of them alone is sufficient. One has um, root, uh, one lacks roots and the other lacks perspective, uh, but you need both. The trouble is there's too much of one and too little of the toad's eye science is what we are arguing. Now, we'll, I'll go to examples of uh, water. Water is inherently an interdisciplinary subject. In fact, I would challenge you to find one, one particular, any department in any university which does not deal with water, even literature and poetry. The trouble is, water has been hegemonized by two particular disciplines. Civil engineering and what I would call bad economics, bad financial economics that stops at benefit cost analysis of questionable value. And that's it. Sometimes law, little bit, but the kind of law that is really done is how to avoid uh, you know, litigation from contracts that go bad. But not really law as you and I understand it about regulation. I have challenged around the world, I've challenged, I've said, find me, Anywhere in any southern country, a water resource ministry or a water department which has got in senior position any discipline other than civil engineers, very little, very little. 
A uh, couple of them, in, I know in India and uh, in uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, it's Sri Lanka and Nepal quite well. A couple of econ economists do show up, but they don't last very long. You, know, you get so discriminated by the civil engineers that they just quit okay, and go join, join the World Bank. <laughs> now, but, so this disciplinary hegemony has created tremendous anti-disciplinary problems and really not led to good water practices. If you look at this diagram, and this is a cartoon we did for groundwater overdraft in Madras and uh, Gujarat and Nepal and all these places, and you clearly see four proclivities. You know, you've got a very hierarchic village headman type who says, oh, there's groundwater overdraft. You know, this joker over here has got his high capacity pump and is pumping away. So what he says is governments must frame rules and regulations. India has been trying, I think, you know, but if you have 50 million pumps in everybody's backyard, how are you going to make laws that regulate it? You need at least 50 million policemen. You're not going to get it. Now, on the other hand, you have this guy who's fine. You know, he's got market economics working for him, uh, financial one, that is. It works for him because he grows cabbages or alpha alpha and sells, and uh, he's fine with it, uh, market individualism. You, of course, have the angry activist egalitarian who doesn't like what the government is doing and doesn't like what the market is doing. Now, if you look at this picture, you will see that there is a proclivity towards law as a discipline in the social sciences, a proclivity towards market economics when you come to market you know, actors, individualism. And it comes to this end, and you find in the activist area, it's critical theory, critical anthropology, and so on, which is deconstructing forever and ever and never coming to any recommendation, mm. uh, which is what anthropologists do all the time anyway. Okay. So you would clearly see that there is, in policy framing, there's a very, very distinct bias towards particular disciplines, depending on where you come from. In a study, a review of the European Union's water policy in FP4, FP6, Tony Allen, myself, and about 10 other professors we looked at what was happening, and this is one diagram that we came up with in the end, talking about what we see as institutional filters. That different institutions have filters and problem selections. Certain data is accepted as data. Other data are filtered out as noise. And how that filtering out is going on determines the nature of science that or water science, or any other science for that matter, that you would conduct. Of course, here you have the fatalist world, you know, the couch potatoes. The programmer is the filter and decides what programs you can watch and cannot watch. And that's fine with the couch potatoes, I guess, you know. But the trouble is you come to this market individualism, the world of consultants, and this data picking. Uh, that consultant is the filter who decides what is data and what is noise. If there is a secret government report and he needs it to get his contract, he's going to bribe the minister's secretary to get it. You know, it's so simple. And the stupidity, there's only a crime to be stupid, not to break the law there. You know, because if you didn't do it, your opponent is going to do it anyway. So what's the point? Okay. This is the most interesting world, uh, the world of activist egalitarianism. And uh, it's dialogue over there, which is very often cacophony. It goes on, on, on and on. Everybody has to be pleased. Everybody has to talk to everybody. And the famous story of Oscar Wilde who said he stopped attending these evening, uh, these, these whatever discussion groups because he said they took up too many free evenings. Those of us who have attended activist groups know that it takes about seven days to get a two-line resolution out of anything. Hmm. But that's what it is. And these are civil movements. But the most interesting is the bureaucratic, what we call hydrocracies the water bureaucracies, where registration is the important thing. And the filtering is done by this process, by the law, the procedures in place, where certain information is rejected, certain is allowed in. Who has the right to accept what information and give out what information? And God forbid if you gave out the wrong information that you are right information that you are not authorized to give. You'll be hanged. So this is where most of the debate goes on with, with, with hydrocracies. And it's important to see how institutions filter data and therefore filter in and filter out. And what is information to one is noise to the other. What is filtered out by a bureaucracy, hydrocracy as you know, irrelevant, that it doesn't help dam building anyway, so let's just chuck this out. If picked up by Greenpeace, God help that department afterwards. So 
one man's information is another man's noise and vice versa. Now, this leads me to this question of you know, who defines the problem as we have talked again and again. And one of them is in Nepal, everybody talks about glacial lakes. And uh, yeah, it's important, glaciers. The trouble is as Minister of Water, if I were asked to do something on fund glacier, glacier studies, I wouldn't do it. Why? It's important, iconic, I admit, it's very sexy. Okay. You know, global health of cloud, the globe and all that, the third pole and all that nonsense. Huh? The trouble is only 4% of the flow of the Ganges, and in Mekong it's even less, comes from glacial and slow melt. 96% of the problem is elsewhere, it comes from monsoon waters, stored in groundwater and inside the mountains in spring sources. But that's where all the money is in Gloffs, the study of glacial lakes, but nobody studies Bisharis, the landslide dammed lakes. So this is where the problem lies. So I will close with this particular diagram where we talk about the three sciences for the three proclivities. You can easily see a Nehruvian proclivity for high bureaucratic sciences, you know, where scarcity is the problem. Scarcity is a bureaucratic thing, you know. It's just they love scarcity because they can then manage scarcity. Uh, we have 18 hours of power cuts in Kathmandu right now where I live. And our electric utility, and this was known 10 years ago. You know, I left being minister 10 years ago. Uh, but interesting is they manage the load shedding schedule so well. It's just amazing because they love to manage scarcity but not producing new electricity. These are the guys who would have produced new electricity. You know, uh, their argument is abundant. Just you know, get rid of the regulations and we'll do it. You know. But this group, the egalitarian group, the Gandhian one, thinks that the problem is, you know, we're misusing. If, you know, 60% of electricity is so stolen in the city of Bhaktapur next to Kathmandu, why the hell are we trying to build new power plants? You know, go for conservation. So you can see clearly that the different sciences done is very different uh, with the different groups. I will close with two questions I'd like to leave with you. We've been talking about science policy and all that. My question to you is, where do politicians come from? Which one of these areas do different politicians come from? And uh, the question asked by Jill was, uh, you know, uh, interesting about uh, uh, politics and how politicians look for data. Uh, that they want to avoid surprises and they want to be alerted early on to surprises. Yes, no good politics can come with bad science. But then what is good science that alerts a politician to the dangers that come? And I must admit, most of that alerting is coming from this egalitarian sphere right now. It is not coming from the market players and it is not coming from the hydrocracies. Thank you.